Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 158 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. It's official. This has been the frostiest April for the last 60 years here in the UK. That's the frostiest April I've ever seen. No wonder the bees are still shivering. Never fear though, May is on its way with warmer weather for us and our bees to enjoy. short and sweet a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span a beekeeper in fact just like me welcome back once more to the podcast i trust you're all managing to keep safe and well and without wanting to repeat myself from last week managing to continue to endure these rather chilly mornings we continue to see we may well start with the weather forecast you know i enjoy discussions about the weather well it's been cold no doubt about it. Our UK morning temperatures have been more Arctic-like than I'd care to have at this time of the year. We have continued to endure morning frosts. My cucumber plants have died and the allotment hotbed has gone cold. I spent a small fortune raising plants for the allotment this past couple of months using what I describe as my cannabis tent. Before we go any further, it's not not a cannabis tent that is it's a warming bench with an led light to raise my seedlings to get a head start but it's all gone horribly wrong i started them early anticipating i would be planting them out by now and rather than seedlings i now have large plants that have run out of nutrients and look very sad things like tomato plants aubergines sweet peppers and chilies all because the chill we've had through March has continued into April and caused a huge delay in planting out. My own naive fault, but something I wasn't expecting. Hang on, Stuart, I hear you say. This is supposed to be a beekeeping podcast, not gardening. And you're right, but there is a direct comparison to be found here, because just yesterday I found a colony at one of my apiaries that was starving, running out of nutrients, if you like. Hence my gardening comparison, which hopefully works anyway a colony at the end of april starving is not new but quite unusual for me here in norfolk i failed them unfortunately not sure how we missed them but when it came to adding fondant in the final round just a short while back i obviously didn't consider they needed any maybe hefting them gave the impression that they were okay i'm not quite sure Suffice to say, they were a fairly decent size a month ago, but now are a small colony that are going to struggle through the next couple of months as they try to build up, despite my poor management of them. The problem they had is a lack of food, or nutrients, food resources, and as a result, a large part of the colony has perished. Add to this the cooler weather, and in this particular apiary, they really get hit by the northeasterly winds and with that combination they've struggled to get out to forage needing to keep the brood nest as warm as possible with constantly dwindling numbers and any further delays to warmer weather will surely see them perish they're not even large enough to be able to manage a donor frame of sealed brood so small are they they do have a small patch of brood however and if we can get them through one more week it appears the warmer weather will finally break through and we should see them start to increase. Once they have more bees and warmer weather, I could then add a frame of sealed brood to help them along. I wouldn't perhaps do this normally, them being so small now, but I do feel rather responsible for their emergency, so need to assist in this instance. In other news, I've been happy to finally hand over some nucleus colonies that have been purchased from us this year. It's been a slow start and a long wait for our new beekeepers. I would normally have been handing out those nukes much earlier than now, but again the weather has made me delay this very pleasant event. It's always nice to see new beekeepers taking ownership of their new colonies, colonies that I've developed and nurtured from the previous year through the long winter months and into the start of the new season. This year our nukes have been bursting out of the box. We primarily use poly boxes to overwinter our nukes, and these seem to have helped a lot this spring with the cooler conditions. Yet I didn't want to release the nukes until the transfer process into hives could be carried out in safety 
and the colonies can really get stuck into building fresh new comb as they expand in their new homes. Those bees have been a delight to handle too, so I'm sure their new guardians will have a really good season this year, and no reason why they shouldn't get a super of honey this summer, if the weather gods played ball of course. The challenge with the nukes for me was always getting them to a nice size without seeing them starting to produce swarm cells as they run out of space, but the weather certainly held them back enough to grow strongly without being quick to produce those swarm cells. That's not to say we haven't had it all our own way. Inspections have been quick and for the most part uneventful. That is apart from maybe three or four colonies that seem to have had their swarming switch fully flicked to the on position. One in particular on Wednesday this week was something of a surprise. We've been trying out a few buckfast type queens as I've mentioned before and they're generally overwintered well. In fact some have made a very quick start this year despite the weather conditions and are filling up a second brood box with bees, honey and in some instances brood. You may remember from the previous podcasts and videos that I've said I'm going to try out a few colonies without queen excluders and these are growing quite well but more on that another time. Back to the queen cells, this one colony in a Langstroth polyhive has decided it's going to throw up a significant number of queen cells, somewhere in the region of 20 or more. I gave up counting as it was so cold my hands were going blue and I couldn't feel my fingertips. Maybe a little dramatic but it was blooming cold and this is also where novice or beginner beekeepers will sometimes lose colonies to swarms because it really was bitterly cold and not really conditions to make thorough inspections unless you're a little more experienced. The temptation is to leave them another day or two until it warms up and then of course it warms up enough for the bees to make their move and away they go, swarming over the hedge and across the fields never to be seen again. If you've not inspected your bees for a week or more, get in and check them urgently. Swarm cells are appearing in colonies now. Some beekeepers I chat to around the UK have seen a range of colony conditions but all agree swarm cells are there and we're about to see that annual reproduction cycle of the honeybee colony in earnest. I expect the phone to start ringing any day, particularly after our bank holiday weekend coming up. I think with more people still working from home, we have a better chance of swarms being seen again, so hopefully they'll find new homes in swarm boxes and swarm traps. I'm glad to say that for the most part, I'm not seeing a huge number of colonies with swarm cells, Growth has been a little delayed with the colder weather. Remember, the colonies need to maintain that magic temperature figure of 35 degrees Celsius, and that puts pressure on maintaining a core cluster of bees in and around the brood nest to keep it warm. Thus, there are fewer bees to go out to forage, fewer bees to fill up all the brood nest cells with nectar, and hopefully this means a little more space for the queen to lay eggs in. This means a lack of space shouldn't be a cause for swarming, at least not yet. Let's see what next week brings. A change to warmer conditions, hopefully, but that of course will no doubt bring a different set of challenges. Moving on, CBPV seems to be a hot topic once again and I've been seeing a small number of colonies hit with it once again. Chronic bee paralysis virus feels like a highly infectious disease. It seems to be popping up all over the place, and I don't just mean in my colonies. I think I've counted three colonies at different locations this spring showing signs. The shaking uncontrollably, the shiny, almost black, hairless bees. It's not a good feeling when you see it. I'm still convinced drones are the main culprit, and although I have no science to back this up, I did think a little experiment might be worth a try. If I can get some help with setting it up, we might just give it a go, but more of that another time. I'm still of the opinion that for a commercial setup, destruction of these colonies is the only way to proceed. That is, unless you have a completely isolated apiary that you can use. I'm torn in my mind as to how to proceed, but need to make up my mind quickly before we get distracted by swarming. More CBPV updates in the coming months, no doubt, and we're going to have to take some action. Timing between growth of colonies and the oilseed rape crops this year is a little out of kilter. I look at the fields of oilseed rape currently 
and pretty much all of the primary flowering stems are in full flower. There are numerous side stems that are still only just in bud and these will provide some nectar in future weeks but for the most part the main flowering stems are open. What I'm seeing in colonies is large slabs of sealed brood and small amounts of nectar coming in and when I say small amounts I'm talking maybe of three quarters of a super being filled and brood nests having a little nectar in some of their cells. Nothing like the full-on flow where supers are filled almost as soon as they're put on the hives and brood cells are stuffed full of nectar waiting to be moved into other areas. Dare I say we need some rain. East Anglia is always a dry part of the UK and although we had so much rain over the winter months that seems to have filtered down and the fields are looking quite parched. A good soaking now and the nectar will flow and if I could put in a request maybe leave it a week or so please, then a day and night of gentle but constant rain perhaps. That would do us wonderfully. This will allow all of that lovely sealed brood to emerge. Remember workers go from egg to adult, emerging from a cell in 21 days, the larvae being capped over at eight days or thereabouts. Most of the sealed brood I'm seeing has been sealed for a few days now, so given another seven to ten days it should be ready to explode into the hives boosting colony strength, allowing others to head out to forage and filling up those supers which we've all been placing on our hives for just this moment. You will know I've been a convert to the honeypore poly hive for a while now and we're just in the process of putting pollen traps in place, just in a couple to see how this interesting piece of kit works. Honeybees gather pollen and carry it back to the hive in their corbiculi or pollen baskets as they're more commonly known. Pollen is a much needed source of protein for the developing colony, so taking away too much pollen will cause the colony to suffer, so it's recommended that the pollen trap is only in place for around 24 hours. This does mean having to travel back and forward to the hives to remove and swap out the pollen traps, but the amount of pollen you can trap is quite significant. Why do we trap pollen? Well, it sells nicely through health food shops and is in much demand. As a commercial bee farmer, I need to use all the products I can from my colonies to make a living, and this is one that I've not yet tried. I know there are people out there that will not agree with taking pollen from beehives, but again, we each choose how we manage our colonies. I certainly wouldn't put a pollen trap on anything other than a healthy, strong colony, one that's expanded well and can cope with a 24-hour loss of pollen. Colonies currently are packing large quantities of pollen away and storing it in brood frames for use later, so it's important that we don't leave the traps on for a prolonged period, but I'm sure they'll be fine with a 24-hour glitch. Finally, my comedy moment of the week. A couple of weeks ago, I was recording a video and saw some tiny ants, tiny little ants, setting up home on top of one of the cover boards on the honeypore Langstroth hives. Obviously, they also like the nice warm conditions directly above a brood nest. Anyway, as we were recording, I saw them and commented something like, oh look, termites. This was quickly picked up by the online video police and my mistake was pointed out to the world. I guess some people never make mistakes. Anyway, while we were out inspecting and driving across farm tracks between apiaries, a very handsome male pheasant walked across the track in front of us. Obviously a mature, proud lad, he glanced at the truck and as he turned, I noticed he had some very impressive feather tufts on his head. The type that looked like the winged helmet of the god Mercury. Take a look at online paintings of Mercury, not the planet, the god, and you'll see what I mean. Anyway, they were so impressive, I was quite startled, and in a moment of confused amusement, I said out loud, do pheasants have ears? After the laughter had subsided and Google had been consulted, it appears that the answer, in fact, is yes, they do have ears, of course, but what I had seen were some very impressive feather tufts that are mostly for courtship. And that, my beekeeping friends, is why you'll see older chaps with very bushy eyebrows. At least that's my excuse. Anyway, remember a podcast subscription will get you the very latest tips and techniques from me each week as they're released. As things stand, 
it's going to cost less than a couple of Starbucks coffee. And remember, that's the drive through prices. Head over to my Patreon page and sign up to my Podcast Plus tier for the very latest beekeeping chat and an occasional joke, maths and English lessons too. That's it for this week. I'll catch up with you all again next time. But for now, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was Beekeeping Short and Sweet.